afternoon. My name is Chris Gotti. I work at Mayo Clinic Public Affairs. Um, I'm joined today by three individuals, Dr. John Noseworthy, who is the President and CEO of Mayo Clinic, Dr. Bill Rupp, who is a Vice President at Mayo Clinic and CEO of Mayo Clinic in Florida, and Bob Brigham, who is the Chair of Administration and the Chief Administrative Officer of Mayo Clinic in Florida. Also with us today are Robin Kay. Robin is an epidemiologist with the Florida Department of Health. She is here. Hi. And also joining Robin is Dr. Bob Harmon, who is the director of the Duval County Health Department. Dr. Noseworthy will begin with some opening remarks, along with Dr. Rupp and Bob Brigham. And then we will respond to your questions. And then uh, the folks from the Duval County Health Department and the Florida Department of Health will also be in the room following that question and answer to answer any questions you might have. Dr. Noseworthy? <clears throat> Good afternoon. For more than 100 years, Mayo Clinic has had as its primary value the needs of the patient come first. Every activity within every sector of Mayo Clinic focuses on our patients. We have a sacred trust with them that we will provide the safest, highest quality care with the best possible outcomes. We've called this new news conference with you today on short notice as yesterday we uncovered a profoundly disturbing new piece of information. That is, that a single individual violated this sacred trust with his behavior thereby placing our patients and our staff at risk. This is heartbreaking. This information is a critical piece in a complex three and a half year puzzle that we've been addressing tirelessly in a continuous partnership with the Florida Department of Health and with the Center for Disease Control. We're here today to share urgently all the information that we know as we learn it, what we believe to have happened, what we are doing, and what our patients should do. We are continuing to work with the Florida Department of Health, the Center for Disease Control, and now with the Jacksonville Sheriff's Office toward a complete resolution of this violation of this sacred trust. We will share new information with you as this becomes available to us. I will now turn the podium over to Dr. Bill Rupp and Mr. Robert Brigham. Thank you, Dr. Noseworthy. I'm going to try to walk through what we believe went on, what we're doing about it, and what patients should do. Hepatitis C is a viral infection that affects the liver and over the long term, some patients may remain asymptomatic. Some patients go on to develop chronic hepatitis or inflammation of the liver, even cirrhosis or cancer and death. In 2007, we discovered several cases of hepatitis C in a number of patients. Because we had tested these patients before the treatment and then afterwards, we believed that this was a healthcare acquired infection. We worked with the Department of Health and the Centers for Disease Control to try and find the answer to what was happening with this process. Over the ensuing couple of years, several more cases appeared. We looked for all of the common things that might spread a healthcare acquired infection. We looked at glucometers for looking at blood glucose. We looked at multi-use vials of insulin. We looked at the commonest things that might cause spread, all of which came up negative. We then discovered on further testing that at least three of these viral samples were nearly identical when we did genetic testing. Genetic testing can be done on this virus. It takes a number of months, but it showed that at least three samples were nearly identical. That led us to looking for a common source. 
as we looked at where the patients interacted in our institutions and who they met with, it appeared that the common source involved interventional radiology. That's where we place special lines, do tissue biopsies, and, and that sort of thing. There were roughly 23 people that could have been involved with this patient. We tested all of them for hepatitis C. One of them turned up positive. When we did that genetic testing on his hepatitis C, it matched the hepatitis C of the three patients. At that moment, we removed him from caring for patients and put him on leave. We have now discovered, and he has admitted, that in fact he was diverting drugs in this interventional radiology unit. He would take a drug, withdraw it, it was in a syringe, and when things were busy, he would take that syringe, inject himself, change the needle, fill the syringe with saline, and put it back. This all came to light yesterday. That provides a link in this chain that we have been chasing for a number of years. We called the Jacksonville Sheriff's Department and have turned this over to him. Yesterday, I personally spoke with one patient who has hepatitis C and told him that this was coming forward. One of the three patients has already died and we think that hepatitis C contributed to his death. I have spoken personally with his wife and explained the situation. We will be having further discussions as time goes on. The third patient died of progression of his cancer that was unrelated to the hepatitis C. The investigation that Dr. Rupp has talked to you about has occurred over a three year period of time. Very complex tracking this. Uh, we're grateful for the partnership we've had and being able to get the information we could. It sounds as though that was a long time, but I will tell you that as the first two cases were identified, an index of suspicion was raised. And our team notified uh, our colleagues in the health department. From that, we began to gather information about the patients affected, as well as all of the other points of contacts they had, other patients that were in our system, common caregivers, and put together the tens of thousands of bits of information. Over the course of the next two years, additional patients were identified. Theories were postulated as to how might transmission occur, following the probability of most likely scenarios, we tracked aggressively things where blood might pass from patient to patient, such as use of glucometers where we measure blood glucose, or multi-dose vials where a vial is used for multiple injections such as insulin. We worked aggressively in our organization to make sure that all the standards of infection precautions were taken using these tools for delivery of patient care. It was only as subsequent patients were identified that those theories no longer held up and we began to explore alternative theories. The use of the genetic testing that Dr. Rupp identified was key in finding that the likely transmission of this virus was a point transmission, meaning some point by which all of these patients had traveled rather than patient to patient transmission of this disease. 